So, um, Kroger's algorithm is a generic optimization algorithm, meaning that you can apply to any black box function that comes with some kind of description of what correct answers are. So, you're given access to a function f that maps bit strings to Boolean values, and it maps the correct bit string to 1 and all other bit strings to 0. Um, and, and we're looking for A and we're given black box access to F. That means that you're not allowed to look at the source code of F, but you are allowed to query F. And since this is a quantum computer, quantum algorithm, you're allowed to query F on a superposition of many different values. And you'll get a superposition result back. Um, so for now, let's consider the case where the solution that you're looking for is unique. There's only one solution across a very wide space of two to the k possible potential solutions. Um, so the task is to find A, and this generic description captures all sorts of problems from optimization, uh, pretty much search, so hash function inversion is captured here, um, even NP-complete problems are captured by this model, and the best classical runtime that we know at this point is fully exponential, whereas on a quantum computer, well, you have to first define exactly what it means to perform a quantum query. But if you have a description of how f operates, then you can turn this description of how f operates into a quantum description of how f would operate on a quantum computer, but that's sort of cheating because you're not allowed to look at the source code of f. So we are assuming that there is a unitary calligraphic f that operates on a pair of registers, a and c, where a is a sequence of qubits and c is a single qubit. And this unitary computes the value of A, which is a Boolean value, and XORs this Boolean value into C. So this is... If you don't think this is the, the appropriate lifting of the concept of black box access, well then maybe Grover is not the quantum counterpart of brute force search. Otherwise, it is. Um, but surprisingly, we can do much better than brute force search. Basically, you can take the square root of your search space, and that's uh, the running time for Grover's algorithm. Unfortunately, though, Grover's algorithm is inherently sequential, whereas uh, brute force search is embarrassingly parallelizable. This speed up is um, the square root of the search space, meaning that if the search space is infeasibly large to begin with, it might still be infeasibly large even when attacking it on a quantum computer. So this is not a holy grail, but it's possible all the same for some problems to be classically infeasible and quantumly feasible with Grover's algorithm. So what do we need to implement Grover's algorithm? It starts with a uniform sampler, and this is really, really easy because this is just an array of Adamar gates. So this takes the bit string all zeros and turns it into the uniform superposition of all bit strings and I put the pause on my slide too soon because this formula is incomplete. There it is, the uniform superposition of all bit strings. So as i runs through 0 to 2 to the k minus 1, the basis state i is present with equal amplitude. And we can call this state uh, psi. And the way we get it from the L0 state is to apply a Hadamard gate to each qubit. Um, so, psi is a vector, and a, 
the basis state associated with the solution is also a vector. Two vectors that are different span a plane and let's call that the working plane. So A is going to be the same as Psi1, that's just a renaming, and then we also need Psi0 which is perpendicular to Psi1 because we're going to flip about Psi0. Um, but first we're going to flip about the zero bit string. So this is a mirroring in this plane about the, this, well, this vector. Notice that uh, zero does not necessarily coincide with this, this guy. Um, so mirroring about the zero bit string is defined as follows. If your if the value is zero, then it stays the same, and if it is different from zero, then its amplitude is negated. Makes perfect sense. Right, so how do we do this practically? We need to compute this map, which compares x to zero, and if x is different from zero, it XORs one into the second register. Right? But if x equals zero, then it leaves the second register alone. And throughout we keep this additional ancillary qubit set to 0 minus 1. So what happens when we apply this computation? Well, in one case, x is 0, the qubit q is not affected, so it stays the same. But if x is 1, well, then we flip the qubit q, but it's already in a superposition of 0 minus 1. So flipping it will just change the global phase, which is exactly what we want right here. So from this point of view, flipping it doesn't flip it really, because it's still in a superposition of, of 0 and 1, but it does have an effect on, on the global superposition system, namely by flipping the phase. So that's mirroring about the zero vector. We also need to mirror about psi zero. Remember that psi zero is defined as perpendicular to psi one, which is the same as A. So in order to define what psi zero, or what a mirroring about psi zero is, we need to invoke F and basically this is the same function as here, except with a different um, function that we're storing into Q. Namely, the function F, to which we are given black box access. And the strategy is exactly the same. We keep Q in the uniform superposition. Well, it's not really uniform because there is a negation rather than addition, but that's, that's basically the same. We keep Q in the state 0 minus 1, and then by flipping Q when necessary, the only effect is to change the global phase, or flip it rather. So, sketched graphically, we have Psi1 here. This is the same as our solution A, for now. This is the uniform superposition of all bit strings. And these, this vector and that vector span a plane. In this plane, we use psi1 as one axis and choose a vector that's perpendicular to psi1 as psi0. Right? So then, a single iteration of Grover's algorithm is flipped by the zero vector, excuse me, Mirror about psi zero, change of basis, mirror about the zero vector, change of basis once again. So we can graphically illustrate these operations one by one. So assume for instance that we are in a some current state, state i, which we can label phi. In the first operation, we are going to 
flip about psi zero. That's what it says here. The ring shoots this vector all the way downwards. And then we're going to change basis so that this vector becomes aligned with the all zero vector. Apply the change of basis, then flip about this and change basis back. Change of basis, flip, change of basis back. So that was one iteration. Two mirrorings about two different axes that are apart by um, angle delta. So every iteration moves the state closer to the desired state, closer to the solution state, by an angle of two delta. So then the question is, what is delta initially, excuse me, what is theta initially, the initial state, and what is, how many iterations are necessary? Well, we know that we have to traverse a roughly 90 degree angle, so if we know delta, then we can compute the number of iterations, but what is delta? Um, well, consider that this is the uniform superposition of all states, so if you were to write down this vector in full, then you get uh, a very large sequence of 1 over 2 square root of 2 to the k. Um, delta is the sine, so that's this uh, length. of this angle, which we can compute from this vector and this vector. This is the uniform superposition of all bit strings. Excuse me. It's the sine of this angle or the cosine of this angle. So we can compute this sine by computing the inner product between this vector and this vector. And we already know this vector because that's equal to a. And when you have a state that is equal to a basis state, you know that it consists of all zeros and a one in that position that indicates the bit stream that that state represents. So by computing the inner product of this vector and this vector, well, we can easily see that we just need to take one element out of these 2 to the k many, 1 over square roots of 2 to the k. So we basically take one over square root of 2 to the k, and that's a good enough approximation of delta because for small enough angles, the sine of delta is delta itself. Um, so from this we can compute the number of iterations. We divide 90 degrees by 2 deltas per iteration, and we also know that the initial uh, state is really just the uniform superposition of all bits, so that's just delta as well, and that's how you get uh, 2 to the k over 2 iterations. So I, I changed a into psi 1 for a very good reason, and that's because a is not necessarily unique. There might be many solutions, A, B, C, and so on, uh, and, and I didn't want to label them each individually. Basically, amplitude amplification is the same as Grover's algorithm, but it allows you to search when there are multiple solutions. And the uniform superposition of all solutions, that's what Psi1 really represents. In the case where your solution is unique, then it is exactly the same as A, in the case when there are many different A, you just take the uniform superposition, but it's still what spans your working way. Um, and as long as you work inside this plane, you can apply the same principle. The trouble is when you're outside of the plane. So another question is, what if your uniform sampler um, actually knows a, li a little bit about F? so that you can make it sample better than uniform, such that if you apply the uniform sampler and the measure, then your probability will be greater than 
if you were to apply, apply a uniform sampler. Um, and it turns out it doesn't matter at all. This, ax this axis will be shifted somewhere, but as long as it's in the plane, the same principle will still work. Uh, so that's what the people mean by amplitude amplification. It's oftentimes sold as uh, a generic method such that whenever you have some superposition of values, some of which are desirable and some of which are undesirable, you apply amplitude amplification and you increase the amplitude of the desirable solutions at the expense of the amplitude of the undesirable solutions. Can you put some um, values to zero, or probabilities to zero that you don't want in your answer? You can get arbitrarily close, but uh, without observing, you cannot fix it to zero. No, no, but unless your the answers start, happen to match exactly. At the start, if you, for example, you don't want the solution zero to be given, well, you know that it, it gives one. If you put the amplitude of zero to zero, yeah, then you don't find it at the end. Or um, good question. I my guess would be that. Uh, Amplitudes that are set to zero remain set to zero, but I'm not 100% sure about that. I'll, I'll look it up later. Um, all right, that's amplitude amplification. And so, why on earth is there a Y here? So uh, anyhow, the, the running time of your algorithm is really always the square root of your search space. So whenever you have a, a larger number of solutions, you, you take off the, the... Excuse me. Yeah, so the, the 2 to the k represents the potential number of solutions and uh, the a represents the actual solutions. This might have to be a division. At any rate, you take the probability of randomly sampling a solution and that's take the square root of that, that's basically what Grover gives you, or one over the square root of that is the running time of Grover's algorithm or of amplitude amplification uh, to give you a, a suitable solution. So Grover's algorithm and, and amplitude amplification in general is, is not a holy grail. It does come with a couple of drawbacks. Uh, first of all, that it requires Oracle access to this function f. Um, sometimes that's perfectly reasonable, like when querying the, when, when searching for an inverse of a hash function, the, the description of the hash function is, is not too complex, but if f depends on big data, as it does in machine learning, or I should say perhaps some machine learning contexts, well, all this data has to pass through your quantum computer every time you want to query f. And you have to run it an uh, exponential number of queries. So, in this case, there's good reason to suspect that Grover's algorithm will not be the, the holy grail for machine learning, for faster machine learning. Um, also, it's difficult to parallelize Grover's algorithm because it is inherently sequential. What you can do is split the search space in two, same as you would do with a classical brute force algorithm. But a classical brute force algorithm will be twice as fast, meaning that you invest twice the money get twice the number of cores working on your problem and your solution will be there twice as fast. But on a quantum computer, you invest twice the, the amount of money to get twice the amount of quantum computers and your solution will only be there square root of two as fast. So that's really disappointing. Um, so, Particularly for hash collision attacks, um, 
it is possible to Groverize a uh, search for collisions of hash functions or any hash, any function really, but it requires lots and lots and lots of quantum memory, um, which might not be realistic either. So Dan Bernstein actually has a, a paper arguing that the best attack against uh, hash collisions will still be the Wiener von Orschot algorithm, which is, as far as we know, classical, and I don't think he, he thinks of a, a quantum enhancement. Um, so that's Grover's algorithm, which is a bit of a disappointment, because there is some speed up, but it's not a holy grail. Uh, the HHL algorithm is different. It promises a very, very large speed up, but it might only be applicable in very specific situations. So, it's due to Harrow, Hasselden, and Boyd. And, like I said, it provides an exponential speed up, so it's like sure and unlike Grover's algorithm, in this case, for solving large and sparse linear systems. So, Given a matrix A and a vector B, find, a, find x such that A times x equals B, except where your matrix A is too large to write down explicitly. And perhaps even your vector B and x might be too large to write down explicitly, and you don't want to find x in particular, you just want to find some property of x. Um, so this is... a very interesting because there might be problems that this algorithm can be used to solve really, really, really fast, but we don't really know of many of them yet. So it's still waiting for its, its killer application. Um, and it's only applicable in very, very specific situations. This algorithm comes with so much small print that I'm surprised it was not invented by the way. So, um, the problem is, you're given a matrix A of complex numbers. N is really large, 2 to the k, for instance. Uh, well, something in that range where, where k is the parameter the number of qubits is linear in K, so the matrix A is doubly exponential in the number of qubits, roughly. Um, and, and, well, you're not given this vector B explicitly because if you would have to read every value individually, well then you would run in roughly n time steps, which is far too long. Um, we need to assume that A is Hermitian, but that's not a really big cost because you can always transform A uh, in some ways to, to turn it into a Hermitian system with a solution that, from which you can compute the original solution. Um, A has to be sparse. So on every row there have to be at most S non-zero entries. And B must be constructible in this in this way. So B consists of k qubits and hence 2 to the k or n complex numbers that you need to describe the state that's given as a k qubit system. And you need some kind of method to construct this quantum system. Um, because otherwise it would take far too long to read out all the values. This is uh, sort of similar to what we saw, what we saw in Shor's algorithm, where uh, the quantum Fourier transform is applied to these constants. Right. So the the vector to which the quantum Fourier transform is applied is represented on log of n qubits. 
was super dense there, and this is also super dense. Um, log of n qubits. And the output is also similarly super dense. Um, and actually, x is not going to be the output because if you measure x, then it will collapse to one of the basis states and you lose all information about the other elements of this vector. Uh, so what do you do? Well, you evaluate x in a quadratic form. Or you evaluate a quadratic form in x, rather. And this is really performing some quantum operation and then measuring. So, the quadratic form which you want to evaluate in X has to be conducive to some kind of quantum operation, or it has to be conducive to realization as a quantum operation. Um, but if all these criteria are met, then you, can, then you have a massively fast algorithm that runs in the logarithm of M. Which is, which is amazing, because just reading out the problem description it takes longer than producing the solution. Um, classically, hang on, uh, here's a, a parameter. That's the condition number, which is the ratio of the maximum eigenvalue to the minimum eigenvalue. Um, and there is a success probability, so there's a probability for this algorithm to fail, and as this probability is smaller, the running time is larger. That doesn't make any sense. Anyhow, um, classically, we have to run in all of n time steps. But notice that the condition number is only the square root, Whereas here it's the square, so if your condition number is really, 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 really large, in which case your matrix A is really, really ill-conditioned, well then maybe still the, the classical complexity might be smaller. But it, my guess is in, in all practical cases, this log of n will, or rather this n will dominate everything and this log of n will not. Uh, and you take the square root only if A is positive definite, and if it is not, then it's not the square root of kappa, but just kappa. So the first ingredient we need as a sub-procedure in the HHL algorithm is Hamiltonian simulation, which is really the original application of quantum computers, namely using quantum computers to simulate quantum mechanics. So a Hamiltonian is a very large matrix that describes the evolution of a quantum system through the Schrodinger equation, which is a differential equation. And if you remember your calculus, it has a general solution e to the i times this a Hamiltonian matrix times T over, well, I, I guess this constant doesn't really matter that much. Um, and Hamiltonian simulation is to compute, given the starting state, the state after time T. Right? So you're given a, Hamil a Hamiltonian matrix, you're given a time window and an initial state, and the task is to find the state after this time window has passed. And it should really be no surprise that we can do this with quantum mechanics because this describes quantum mechanics. Um, the second ingredient we need for the HHL, HHL algorithm is phase estimation. And we actually, we've already seen phase estimation in the description of Grover's algorithm. So, we've seen it, but not in this language. Uh, we have access to a unitary operation, and we know an eigenvector of this unitary operation 
and an eigenvalue lambda j. And since u is unitary, its eigenvalues are located on the unit circle, complex unit circle. So really the only variable that defines this eigenvalue is the angle, or the phase, which is a number between 0 and 1. And the task is, we're given access to u, and we're given an eigenvector, find the most significant n bits of phi j. So this is the eigenvector that we're given. I, my guess is this would be uj, because i is obviously the square root of negative 1. The task is to find the most significant bits of phi j, and this is a circuit that can do it. So we start with the all zero bit string on the top here, and we use the given eigenvector on the bottom. By applying a sequence of Hadamard gates, we turn this all zero string into the uniform superposition of all bit strings. And then every wire will be the control wire for a subsequent power of 2 of the unitary operation. After applying m powers of 2 of the unitary operation, we apply the inverse quantum Fourier transform to our vector of uniform superpositions, and this should give us the m top bits of the phase. How can this possibly work? Well, the first thing you should realize, well, the zeroth thing you should realize is that after applying the Hadamard gates, we really do have the uniform superposition of all bit strings in the first register, and the second register will still contain the eigenvector. Right? And what happens when we apply a unitary to its eigenvector, we get its eigenvector times the eigenvalue. So when we do that multiple times, we still get the eigenvector out on this side. So it looks as though these unitary operations really don't do anything, except they do. They multiply the global phase by the matching eigenvalues. So these eigenvalues will disappear into the phase here. This describes the state right before the inverse quantum Fourier transform, but you can already see that this is the quantum Fourier transform of phi j. So applying the inverse quantum Fourier transform, you will get, with good probability, uh, a state close to the top n bits of phi j. This is basically the same as a short circuit where this is just multiplication by x, uh, or rather a square and add operation, and you, you apply the controlled square and add operation, square and multiply, excuse me, module n, and then imply, apply the inverse quantum Fourier transform to find the order which is which happens to be the eigenvalue of the square and multiply operation module n. Alright, so now we have all the ingredients for the HHL algorithm. Firstly, we need to construct this input. And the HHL paper says uh, you might want to do this for probability distributions that can be efficiently integrated. But that's one option. Um, another option is that it's not really dense, but only has a, a small number of non-zero elements. Then you can also construct it. Um, so we're going to apply Hamiltonian simulation. Remember, A is the 
matrix that's given as a part of the problem description, and we're going to interpret it as a Hamiltonian matrix describing the evolution of a quantum system, and we're going to apply this quantum evolution for a superposition of time windows. Many different time windows, each with index k. And this allows us to interpret this quantum evolution as a controlled unitary gate. And since every um, quantum evolution is then raised to the next power of 2, we can actually uh, use this superposition of Hamiltonian simulations to do uh, phase estimation, which will become obvious once we write B in the eigenbasis of, well, E to the A, which is always possible because E to the A is unitary. <coughs> so there will always exist coefficients BL such that when you weight the eigenvectors of E to the A with BL, then you get B back. So at this point, we can apply uh, Hamiltonian simulation, or rather, controlled Hamiltonian simulation, and obtain the uh, phases, or rather, the phase. Phases. At this point, we grab this value, invert it, and turned into a phase, or a phase of, of the system, rather, of the amplitude. So, phi L is the eigenvalue of A, because A is in the exponent of E, and the eigenvalue of E to the power A is on the complex circle, whose angle is traced out by phi L. So that's nice. We're going to invert phi L. So we're going to take this value, compute its inverse, and multiply the amplitude of this state by this inverse. And this is... I thought this was the most... the, the trickiest part of the algorithm. Uh, because it's not at all obvious that this should be possible. And indeed, it, it's not always possible, sometimes it fails. Um, so the strategy is to add an extra qubit, initialized to zero, and we're going to rotate it by c over phi of l, excuse me, c over phi l radiant, where c is uh, a constant that guarantees that the length of the state will remain one. So when we rotate it by c over phi l radians, we get the sine describing the amplitude of 1 and the cosine describing the amplitude of 0. For small angles, the sine is the same as its argument, and we can describe the cosine as a function of the sine, and the way we guarantee that we're in, in this world and not in this world is by post-selecting for one. So, after the algorithm is done, we look at this ancilla, or ancilla qubit and we pray to God that it is one. Because when it is one, then we know we applied this operation to the amplitude which is exactly what we need for the algorithm to work. When it's zero, we apply a different operation that's not really useful. So this is where the probability of failure comes into play. But sometimes you just need to run your algorithm more often and then it's, it's still a perfectly probabilistic process, so at some point it's bound to succeed. Uh, the normalizing constant isn't very relevant, that just guarantees that the state always has length 1. Um, 
At this point, we reverse this phase estimation process. So we undo the calculation of phi L. So phi L disappears. And then we have the eigenvectors of e to the a weighted by the inverse of their eigenvalues times the coefficients beta j, beta l, excuse me, that give b. So this is really the inverse of a times b, which is exactly the vector x we're looking for. But once again, we cannot just measure this x because measurement will collapse the state to one of its many values or one of, of the, the basis states where the amplitude is different from zero rather and that will lose all information on the value, values of these amplitudes. So we have to measure an aspect of x through this quantum computation that simultaneously represents a quadratic form. So that's the HHL algorithm. On to quantum finance. Um, so in general, you should bear in mind that big data and quantum computers don't go together well. Um, I've, I've said this a couple of times in the past and I'll continue to say it. Also, quantum computers don't do well with generic optimization problems. What you want is for your problem to be described with a very small amount of data, to have a large complexity and preferably a large amount of structure. Small data, complex problem, and structure preferably. A structure which you can exploit by engineering interference. So whenever you have these two bullet points, then maybe quantum algorithms can be useful. Um, so we saw on the, on the last algorithm, the HHL algorithm, that it can be useful um, for super dense representations of data where you use k qubits to represent 2 to the k units of data. And as long as you can stay in this world where k qubits represent 2 to the k units of data and postpone sampling all the way until the end, well then maybe in this, in this super dense world you can do some useful computations before you have to measure. But you always have to measure at the end. Um, so there are a, a, a couple of keywords that people use with which to sell quantum finance. And the first one of this is dynamic portfolio optimization. If I understand properly, the idea is that uh, you, you have a portfolio that's um, responding to changes in markets so as to allocate optimally and, and lose as little as possible or to gain as much as possible in response to changes in the market. Um, and I, I didn't really see these two bullet points or, or this third one applying in this case. So I don't think that's a match. Scenario analysis is uh, you're going to set your investment strategy fixed beforehand and you're going to analyze what is going to happen in a wide range of possible sequences of events. And in this case there is a mixed bag because some of it involves uh, random walks and some of it really just involves uh, optimization. Um, speaking of random walks, uh, random walks can be used to compute the value of options, and I think there is, there is definitely potential there. I actually have a slide on that, that which is my next slide. 
so my next slide is specifically for option pricing, but it also applies more generally to any uh, uh, financial application uh, that requires random walks. And I also found an application to clustering, um, or a potential application rather to clustering, but I'm not sure why um, financial uh, quantitative financial analysts need clustering, but I will take on good faith that they do. So, random and quantum walks. Um, the black skulls equation models the price of European style options, and it's a very complicated expression, but it's basically equivalent to the heat equation, which I'm a little more familiar with which is a diffusion equation, and it models the diffusion of heat in a medium over time, like this. Um, except, <clears throat> heat is perhaps an idealized form in, 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 on the market, there are all possible, uh, all possible type of, of random events that, that change the particular things. Um, so, one way to model this is to use a Monte Carlo or a random walk type algorithm. So, you, you start with a random sample in your, your first, um, in, in the medium, distributed along the heat at time zero, and you take a random walk uh, of t time steps, and uh, as the number of walks increases, then you get a pretty good idea of the distribution at the end. And the problem with this strategy is firstly that you have to do many, many, many walks until you actually get something that represents the distribution correctly because these walks were random but it seems as though there's a cluster here and there's a cluster here and that's really just a function of the randomness that I chose. Well, the MATLAB in this case chose. Um, but obviously, as we increase the number of, of random walks, then the picture sketched by all these walkers is closer to the truth. Um, and then we, we can apply uh, some kind of function to this distribution, because we know it better. Um, so, that reminds me a little of of uh, Richard Feynman's path integral formulation, which um, is simultaneously an interpretation and a description of the movement of electrons. So, in Feynman's eyes, an electron traveling from point A to point B takes all paths simultaneously. So, we can do the same with these random walkers, right? Instead of defining, fixing their path precisely to one possible path, we can make this, this quantum random walker take all possible paths simultaneously. Um, in which case we get a faster spreading and we can model interference effects. It seems highly likely to me that there can be natural mechanisms on the market that lead to natural clusters but that you could only discover after performing massive amounts of simulations. If you can take account of these natural clusters through interference, well then your quantum algorithm can definitely, uh, can definitely beat classical algorithms. Um, and there's, there's one more thing here. Uh, it's possible to run the simulation and delay sampling because at this point we have a quantum distribution which we can use as an input to a function which computes a function of the distribution which is most of the time what you want anyway. You don't want a function of a list of samples, you want a function of the distribution. So you don't have to sample every time. Um, for instance, if you want the average value that, that might be a lot faster with, with a quantum block. And then the second application I found was clustering. 
potential application. I, I'm, I'm not 100% sure it will work, but it might. So the, the task in clustering is that you're given a list of data points, which I colored red or blue according to the cluster they are in, but the solver does not have this color information yet. And the solver has to decide for every data point whether they belong to the red or to the blue cluster. And there are very neat algorithms that can solve this in the case where the clusters are linearly separable, but in, in this case there is no axis that we can draw to, to separate these clusters, because any such axis will necessarily cut through one of the clusters. Um, so one way to, to solve this problem on a classical computer, I remember, is through kernel principle component analysis. And the idea is you take your, your data points and you, with your data points you define a kernel matrix where every ijth component is defined as the inner product of two very, very large vectors, or rather, two embeddings of these vectors in a much larger space. <coughs> and, right, so this space is very large, and because it's so large, then there is a linear boundary that neatly separates the two clusters. But, you only need the inner product. So once you have this matrix, well then you can look at the principal eigenvector and uh, look at every data points, rather, the ith row of this kernel matrix projection on the principal eigenvector, and if this projection is smaller than zero, you can color it red, and larger than zero, then you can color it blue, and that's exactly how I created this picture. Um, so the, the key point that makes this work is that you lift these, vector, the, these data points to a much, much larger space. So they go from, from n-dimensional space, where n is 2 in this case, to l, l can even be infinity. As long as you can efficiently compute this, this inner product. Of course, that restricts your num the number of embedding functions to functions for which you can efficiently compute this inner product. And the radial basis function, uh, this one is, is one such function. And there are a couple of others, but not too many. But this is where uh, quantumness may come to the rescue, because, well, quantum, a quantum computer may make more embedding functions possible, because you can get away with representing these embeddings super densely, as in a vector of this form. Where, where you have k qubits representing 2 to the k complex values. Possibly, I, I didn't do the exact maths yet, uh, possibly this enables more um, kernel functions and better clustering algorithms. Alright, thank you for your attention.